Economic neoliberalism, it's an ideology that believes in free trade, open markets, and less government control. It's also the cornerstone of Western economic philosophy, and has been for many decades now. But as the world's richest nations struggle with a prolonged economic downturn, has the time come to reject neoliberal thinking? Hello, I'm Mike Walter, and this is The Heat. Recession, spending cuts, economic unrest, and government bailouts. Over the past few years, they've shaken some of the biggest economies in Western Europe and North America. And the ripples are being felt around the world. So as Western nations fight to restore economic stability, we ask, is neoliberal economics failing? For decades, the United States led the world in practicing and promoting private enterprise, deregulation, and global commerce. Decades of Cold War and the collapse of the Soviet Union bolstered Western belief in the power of the market and the role of private corporations. American economist Milton Friedman and former British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher were among those who believed an unfettered economic system was the only way to create stable, secure societies. In fact, Margaret Thatcher's slogan for this was the acronym TINA, which means there is no alternative. But a mortgage crisis in the U.S. in 2008 dragged much of the world into recession. Critics say it blew the lid off a corrupt capitalist system where American financial institutions were blamed for bending the rules and manipulating the system for profit. Four years later, the U.S. is still struggling, and Europe is being buffeted by a wave of national fiscal emergencies and banking problems. Joining me now to discuss this is economist Jeremy Rifkin, who has advised the European Union on the economy, climate change, and energy security for the past decade. He's also a prolific writer and the author of the latest book, which is called the Third Industrial Revolution, How Lateral Power is Transforming Energy, the Economy, and the World. We want to welcome you to the show. Thanks so much for coming in. Nice to be here. Is it time to recalibrate how we're doing things as, as far as, uh, you know, this neoliberal economic thinking? I'm a real fan of the, the market uh, social model. You have to have both. Uh, I believe you need the market's helpful because it can spawn entrepreneurial interest and, uh, and risk taking. But it also has to be checked with a social model. Uh, because if the market's left by itself, it can run wild. And you get to a point where you have a winner-take-all scenario, a handful of the rich get richer, everyone else gets poor and well, marginalized out. And clearly that's what we saw here in the United States. And we yeah. saw investment not so much in, in value. Uh, I have a friend who says they, they invested in vapor, these, these uh, derivatives, and it's just moving money all around and people making money not really on value or anything, and then all of a sudden it collapses. The reason it collapsed, and in the Third Industrial Revolution, Chapter 1 in that book really goes into this in detail. What happened is our Second Industrial Revolution took off with the Interstate Highways, biggest public works project in history. That Interstate Highway system in the 50s, 60s, and 70s allowed us to build suburban uh, uh, communities, a lot of construction uh, business. And then we were able to put in the shopping malls and create a mass consumer society all of that because of the interstate highways. And that peaked in the late 80s. We overbuilt, and we went into a great recession in the late 80s because we overbuilt our, our housing. And then to come out of that recession, we didn't have a new economic revolution in place. The internet was boutique. So what we did is we started to live off the savings of the second industrial revolution, and we've been doing it for 20 years. Well, let's talk a little bit about your revolution, but first let me talk about regulation, because there's a lot of people who say that the regulation wasn't in place, and that's why things collapsed. Do you think that's true, and, and does there need to be more regulation? Well, I think that uh, there needs to be a balance between uh, incentivizing the market and making sure there are checks and balances in place so the market doesn't run to the extreme. Uh, that's why you need a social market model. And I think Europe provides a little bit of a better frame of reference for that. Uh, we have to make sure that government is there and civil society is there to ensure that the fruits of new economic opportunity are widely uh, distributed so that you have a more equitable and just uh, society. If not, it can end up like the U.S. We were the most middle class society in the world in 1960. Today, we're 29th out of 31 OECD countries in income disparity. Only Turkey and Mexico have greater disparity in income. That's not a good test of a country's ability in the long run. Well, and a, a poison gets into the system and it just it, it manifests itself. Uh, Europe also, also impacted by what happened here in the United States, correct? I mean, Absolutely. And so um, how do you rectify that? I mean, if, if the United States is having issues and it just trickles across 
into Europe, how do you protect yourself against that? Well, what I, what we, uh, clearly the problem here is there's a global problem, and that is the second industrial revolution based on fossil fuels and the technologies that go with it are sunsetting. Let me share an anecdote. When Chancellor Merkel became chancellor, she asked me to come to Berlin in the first few weeks of her government to ask, to help her address the question, how do you grow the German economy? The first question I asked the chancellor, how do you grow the German economy, the European economy, or the global economy in the sunset, the last stages of a great energy era, and a whole industrial infrastructure built on it? That's a global issue. So what we need now is we need a new economic vision and a game plan to go with it to move us to a third industrial revolution to create the jobs, the new opportunities, the new businesses for the 21st century. And you, you believe strongly that's uh, clean energy, it's green energy, and yet, um, you understand that if people invest, they want a return on their investment. And yet, when you look uh, across the, the globe, I mean, we're seeing in Germany, it was at Q-Cells, Evisol, uh, Solyndra here in the United States, all of these companies who invested in green technology, all of them going bankrupt. So is it just too early? What's the problem? No, it's not understanding how you lay out a third industrial revolution uh, infrastructure. President Obama's mistake, for example, he spent billions of dollars of U.S. tax money, stimulus money. But he did it on standalone projects, a solar factory in one state, a battery factory in another state, unconnected. What we need to realize is that the great economic revolutions in history occur when two things happen. First, new energy regimes emerge. But then those new energy regimes require new communication revolutions to manage them and coordinate their activity. So when communication revolutions converge with energy revolutions, we have the big shifts in history. That's going on right now. Right now, we're beginning to see in the last 24 months a new convergence of communication and energy. It's starting in Europe, especially in Germany, but watch China. Watch China. The Internet, of course, is a powerful communication revolution. And what's interesting about the Internet is it's distributed and collaborative, and it scales to lateral power. This Internet communication revolution is now merging with a new energy regime, distributed energies, which are organized collaboratively and scale laterally. The sun, the wind, the heat under the ground, the ocean tides and waves, rural agriculture waves, they're, they're everywhere. The question is how do you collect them and create a new economic infrastructure? But, but let me stop you there. The wind blows when it feels like blowing. Uh, the sun's only out a certain amount of time. The clouds come up. It, it's not predictable. It's difficult to harness. Uh, I know if I've got a coal power plant, all I have to do is throw a little bit more coal on. The plant continues to work. When do we get to the stage, because this sounds terrific to all environmentalists, but, but it's, it's an idea idea and execution, those are two different things. Well, let me say, it's an execution in Germany. Uh, if people want to know, is this just an idea? Germany is moving on this whole infrastructure. Let me lay it out, especially the storage part. The EU is committed formally to a five-pillar third industrial revolution. Pillar one, shift to 20% renewable energies by 2020, a third of electricity green. Pillar two, how do you collect energy that's everywhere, the sun, the wind, buildings? We have 191 million buildings in the European Union. The goal is to convert every existing building to your own personal power plant. So you can collect solar off the roof, wind off the walls, heat under the ground. And the analogy here is this. 1970, a few mainframe computers. Then this kid Steve Jobs comes along. He invents the personal computer. Now, 2.3 billion people create their own information. Today we have a few power and utility companies, but already in Europe several million buildings are generating their own energy. And in 10 years from now, tens of millions of buildings all over the world are going to generate their own green energy. And in 25 years from now, hundreds of millions of buildings, China, around the world, will collect energy on site. And just like we collect our own information, we're going to collect our own energy. Pillar three is the one you talked about, storage. You're right. The sun isn't always shining. The wind's blowing at night. You need the electricity during the day. So we have to store it. We're going to use hydrogen and all sorts of other storage technologies to store these energies so they're reliable. Pillar four is where the internet converges with the new energies. We use off-the-shelf internet technology and take the electricity and power grid of China, Europe, and the world, we transform it to an energy internet. So when millions of buildings are collecting green energy on site, storing it in hydrogen, like you and I store media and digital, then if you don't need some of that electricity, your software can connect you so you share that electricity across an entire continent on an energy internet. And pillar five, plug it into your electric vehicles, your fuel cell vehicles, your transport and the infrastructure. 
that whole five pillars is the economic paradigm. Again, it sounds great on paper, and yet you talk about the sun setting, and, and if there was one place where nuclear would certainly be shunned, it would be Japan, and the OE uh, plant just went back online. It, it did, it, but uh, what, the rest of Japan is uh, pretty hostile to it coming back on. And, and but I think, doesn't it indicate that we aren't at this stage? I mean, it's going to take a long time to implement right, what you're talking let me, about. Let me, let me say this. Pillar one, Germany is at 20% green electricity last year and heading to 35%, everybody listening, by 2020. Pillar two, Germany has converted one million buildings to personal power plants in seven years and created 370,000 net jobs. Pillar three, they're testing the, the energy internet now in six regions of Germany. Pillar, uh, that's pillar three and four. Pillar five, Daimler and the other car companies are coming out with their fuel cell vehicles in mass production in 2014 to plug in the infrastructure. So when people say it isn't working, at least in the most robust industrial economy per capita in the world, Germany, they're moving ahead. We're going to have to leave it there. Thanks so much. Very interesting uh, conversation. Appreciate you stopping by. When we come back, we look at the world's two largest economies and ask, who's doing capitalism better? Is it China or the United States? We'll put that question to our panelists in just a moment. From emerging powers to expanding partnerships, from fighting poverty to combating climate change, booming economies, war-ravaged nations, and everything in between, we capture the changes affecting the most dynamic and diverse continent on the planet, taking you beyond the headlines to the people and their stories. Asia Today, delivering Asia to the world. Asia. Asia means business. There is no more they, or you, or me. In today's economic landscape, there is only we. An interconnected world of business, trade, and investment. Daily coverage told simply, with insight and new perspectives. Biz Asia America, our world of business. We are CCTV America. Welcome back. The United States and China are the world's two largest economies. Their markets and manufacturing sectors are dependent on each other, yet their economic systems are very different. China has adopted a novel system it calls a socialist market economy. It's a mixture of government-owned industries and a free market. That model has catapulted the country to the world's second biggest economy in a relatively short amount of time. And it has also seen major social benefits. China has lifted at least 500 million people out of poverty, and half of its population now lives in urban centers. In contrast, the world's biggest economy, the United States, has the highest economic disparity in the Western world. The top 1% now controls more than 40% of the nation's wealth, while the bottom 80% owns just 7%. So the question we're asking our panel, is China doing capitalism better than the United States? I'm now joined from Connecticut by Peter Schiff, who heads Euro Pacific Capital, a U.S. brokerage firm. He's also a radio host and author in his latest book, has sort of a gloomy title, America's Coming Bankruptcy, The Real Crash, How to Save Yourself and Your Country. We'll talk to him a little bit about that. Also with me here in the studio, Fred Smith. He's the president and founder of Competitive Enterprise Institute. It's a Washington, D.C.-based think tank that focuses on the principles of limited government, free enterprise, and individual liberty. liberty rather. I want to welcome both of you to the show. Peter, let me start with you. I, I was having lunch recently with a... Uh, gentleman who does business both here in the United States and China. And I, was, I posed this question to him, and I said, why is there a difference? And he said, because the Chinese don't take capitalism for granted. Is that a safe way of describing it? Well, I think a better way to phrase your underlying question 
is does America do capitalism worse than China? Now, you mentioned that China is succeeding with this some kind of combination of free market capitalism and central planning with some government-owned industries. The reason that China is succeeding is not because of government involvement. China is succeeding despite that. It's just that there's enough capitalism in China to overcome all these government obstacles. The problem is there's a lot of central planning in America as well. And I would argue that there's more in America, that we have more distortion of the market based on our government meddling through the tax code, with guaranteed loans, uh, with the Federal Reserve, with various subsidies. I think we are doing more damage to capitalism in America than China is in China. And the results speak for themselves. Look at the enormous surpluses that the Chinese are accumulating. We run up these huge deficits. And I would disagree. You described it as a symbiotic relationship where we both benefit. I think right now it's more like a parasite and a host where we're feeding off the Chinese economy. They're, they're suffering because they're sending us all these goods that we can't pay for. They give us real stuff that we can use, and we give them dollars that they can't use. Okay, all Peter, let me, let me stop you there, because I want to give Fred a chance to jump in here for just a second. Hold on, hold on for just a second. Fred, I want to give you a chance to respond. One of our staffers points out that you don't have to teach the grass to grow. Economic growth happens. Entrepreneurship is a natural phenomena. But you just move the rocks off the world, off the ground. What has happened in China is they looked over the trade, they saw Hong Kong, growing grass, economic growth, and they jackhammered a few holes in that cemented over economy that was totalitarian in China, and those holes unleashed enough talent, as Peter points out, to create growth. But there's still massive amounts of, of rocks on the Chinese lawn, and the question is whether they're going to take them off or not. Right now, they're a mixed economy. They're, they're a, they've got all the problems of centralized planning, national industrial policy, you know, we have our roads, our bridges to nowhere. They have their cities with no one living in them. They have basically misdirected massive amounts of capital, well, and they're going to pay for that, well, and the Chinese people are going to pay for that. Me, let me stop you there, because another distinction one might make about what China is doing differently than the United States. In China, it's value. They look at value. In the United States, it seems like we look at vapor. Uh, so many people are working the market, trying to short things. It's not real value, and they're trying to make money in a hurry. And isn't that one of the problems, Peter? I mean, we talk about derivatives. We talk about all the problems the United States has gotten into. And this is really the crux of it, isn't it? Well, no, the crux of it is, it is we used to have a, a real capitalist economy uh, back in the 19th century, and we still had a lot left in the early part of the 20th century. But we began to basically go down the wrong path during the progressive era around the turn of you know, 1900, and then we went to Roosevelt with the, with the New Deal, then the Fair Deal under Johnson, and now what we've got now is we no longer have a free market. We've got this phony economy with government uh, directing all the capital to education, to health care, to services. Nobody is saving because the Fed's got interest rates at zero. Everybody is in debt. We've got a huge bloated government on the federal level and also on the individual state level. So we've got this economy that can't, isn't really sustainable. But, but we Peter, depend on Peter, foreign capital but, but and Peter, foreign production. Peter, and got, China's problem Peter, is they've kind well, of... Peter, Peter you know, give Fred a chance to jump in Peter, here for just a second. Got a, you've got a gloomy story, and God knows yeah. there's a lot to be sorry about in the way America is misdirected. And the progressive era, of course, was the fatal flaw that led us on the wrong track. But nonetheless, China has about 40% of its economy not in crony capitalism, but actually owned by government. It still has a highly degree of centralized control. It has the fact that entrepreneurship is still harder there. As bad as the regulatory structure, you didn't mention regulations, which is the way the U.S. economy, control, the US economy is controlled. We don't have Crony capitalism and regulation are the real problems in America, and we're, but we're still an entrepreneurial society, more than any other way in the world. You've got to go through a minefield in America to be an, a successful entrepreneur, but in China, you've got to get the permission of the bureaucrats. It's still easier to be an entrepreneur in America. God knows, far harder than it should be. But don't underestimate the fact that we could still turn this country around. China has got a lot of transitional problems.
Well, I would argue, though, though I think it's certainly I think it's harder in America to start from scratch than in China. I think we have a, har a higher raise of regulations. I just know in my own business right now, I own a brokerage firm. It is impossible. There is no way I could ever start that firm today the way I did myself in the 1990s because the barriers to entry are now so high. The government imposed compliance costs. It's impossible for a young person to repeat what I did. But well, I think right. it might be that's easier right. to do something that's like right. that in China. It's certainly a lot easier in Hong Kong, which is still well, part Hong of Kong, China. Yes, Hong Kong is the example of all of us, but it's a city state, and it certainly has helped China to come to its senses, and maybe, maybe it'll help us come to our senses. But look, as bad as the barriers to entry are, and government continuously, when an entrepreneurial field opens up, the regulators finally rush in, try to close it down. But America so far has found entree points, parts of the frontier that have not been closed down. And that's why the vaporware you talked about earlier, that's why the nanotech, biotech fields haven't been destroyed in America. They've been weakened, they've been slowed, but we're still creating wealth in the new fields. The challenge is, can we recognize that that well, grass will but, wither and but die it's, it's and being dwarfed get out by the, the liabilities. We're, we're, running, we're running $600 billion a year trade deficits. I mean, walk into a store, go into Walmart, find something that was made in America. Everything is made in China in those stores. No, How can we is, be more competitive? No, 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 How can it be so easier silly. to start business you're not, look, you're smart when they're enough. eating our lunch? But Peter, you're smart enough to know that this fetish for the industry, dying industries of the past, agriculture, we've left that, manufacturing, we've left that, service, we're leaving. We've got a whole, the, wor the wor creative destruction is about continuously moving to the part of the world that has not yet been closed down. And that's why we see so much creativity in America, because it's Bureaucrats are not smart enough to close down the future. They try, but we still have a society that does it. We don't have to get a, bureau, a, a political's approval before we try something new. And all of the things that we disparage, the service industry, the vaporware industries you put, are the ways wealth is being created in the modern world, and they're being created here, not in China. Peter, let me give you a chance to respond. Uh, how, how, what's your view? What's happening in American manufacturing is not creative destruction. It's just destruction. If you go back to the Industrial Revolution, uh, when we became a manufacturing economy, we didn't destroy our farms. The farms just became so productive that we could feed all the people working in manufacturing. In fact, we can export. We didn't start importing our food uh, from, from Europe because we had manufacturing. What we've done now is destroy our manufacturing sector, and we now import Peter. all the things that we used to make ourselves, while millions of Americans are unemployed. This is pure destruction, and it's because of big government policies. It's, it, the government has made it too expensive to hire Americans with all the rules and regulations and taxes, and the Federal Reserve has destroyed our capital by keeping interest rates so low. Meanwhile, we're borrowing all this money from China. We're, you talk about these ghost towns that the Chinese have built these cities. The stupidest thing they have did is buy treasury bonds. they got a lot more treasuries to worry about than cities, and if they stop buying all those treasuries and let their own currency rise, then citizens would have plenty of purchasing power to move into those ghost towns. Peter, 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 yes, of course, but you're, you're, again, you overstate your case. Look, we're all aware, we agree about a lot of the problems America has, but manufacturing didn't disappear. We outsourced a lot of the components of it in a global economy. The Chinese have much more trouble doing that outsourcing because they're more of a closed economy. The, the challenge we face as societies But we have, are we have a $600 billion a year trade so deficit. So what? Six hundred billion so dollars a year a trade deficit. Trade we are drowning don't mean in red ink. Thing. What's going to happen when trade interest rates rise in anything. America and we can't service this debt? Peter, trade deficits hmm? are not taken seriously by any serious well, let scholar. Me, let me, and you know better than that. I mean, it's just, it's just like well, one of those shovels. It's a there, shovel there that people okay. fall okay. out of there. Guys, it, yeah. time out for just a second. Let me ask another quick question. Uh, you know, China is uh, the world's largest creditor nation. The U.S. has the world's largest debt. Right. Uh, it appears to me China is doing something right. I mean, would you give it that, Fred? I think China is doing a lot right. The real challenge is how do we make China as better, as good as it could be? We would be great if China dwarfed what they're doing now. We, we would be better if China were 10 times richer than they are now. And the trouble is the Chinese have internal problems they've got to face. We have internal problems we have to face. We, we can't solve China's problems for them, and God knows they can't solve our problems for them, but both of us can do better. Milton Friedman, we're both trapped in a national well, industrial policy. You know, we're both trapped in a situation where government's too big. But government's bigger there still. It's getting smaller. Wait, let, me, let me give Peter a chance we, to jump in here then. 
Yeah, we, we, we are living off of China's productivity right now. The way that China would get richer is to stop buying dollars, stop buying treasuries, and let their own currency rise. That would bring down prices in China. That would lift the standard of living of everybody living in China. But what would that do in America? That would send consumer prices through the roof. That would send interest rates soaring. And we would be in the same position as Greece. Well, ch look, should China have a different monetary policy? You know, the what is that? One person in a million understands uh, monetary policy, and I meet him every time I take a cab across town. <laughs> uh, the real challenge is that China, has, China will undoubtedly do some of that. They've slowed that down, as you know, because they're worried. They've got a mercantilistic policy like we do. We both want to export and not import anything. That's silly. We benefit well. Trade is <laughs> but, mutually well. Trade is the, mutually. The only reason you export is to import. You, you export to pay for your imports. The key is to increase your standard of living by having more consumer goods for your citizens. Uh, See, America, have done we're that. dependent uh, we on all the that. goods that we import on credit because we're not producing enough and we're not saving enough, which is why we don't have the capital to produce. Well, you know what, Peter? I wish I, I could save more time for this discussion, but unfortunately we've run out of uh, time. Peter, can't thank you enough for joining us. Uh, you, you've had a lot of interesting insights, Fred. It's great uh, getting your take on things as well. <laughs> Thanks, Certainly Peter. appreciate it. <laughs> Well, while the debate continues over which system is better, there's one man who has made the best of both worlds. Chinese gymnast Chao Leong was a star in his country, winning dozens of medals. But 20 years ago, he moved to the United States and is now living his American dream in more ways than one. Craig Morrill has details. Chao Liang came to the United States as an accomplished athlete, but he could barely speak English and knew little about the world outside of gymnastics. 20 years later, the Beijing native is an institution in his adopted country and a highly successful businessman. Well, I did not have much clue on what's going on 20 years ago, on what, what is the United States look like, even though I came here, competed it. Eventually, it would be a return to his hometown for the 2008 Olympics that catapulted Xiao to world prominence as a coach. There, he led American Sean Johnson to three medals and the U.S. team to a silver. That crowning moment has its roots in the American farming state of Iowa. Chiao came here in 1990 to learn English and coach at the University of Iowa, a job that he left to pursue a life's dream. I always wanted to uh, have my own business and uh, my own school. So after working for Iowa for eight years, I felt that one, um, I can do more if I starting the students uh, at their younger age. And secondly, I can be uh, more in control when you have your own business on where you want to go. Along with his wife, Shuang Li Wen, he started off teaching students in a leased space in the state capital, Des Moines. I was renting a, a facility, a, a warehouse. We were um, pretty much uh, maxing minimize the potentials. So I have students already, and then we just overgrow it, and then we moved over to building it. Xiao designed this 14,000 square foot gym himself on the site of a cornfield. Demand became so intense that he added a second gym of the same size about two years ago. There are also two national champions and one world champion training right here at Chow's Gymnastics. The center has begun to attract gymnasts from all over the United States to train here, and they've even begun coming from overseas. Xiao says he's the only Chinese emigrant in the world to have coached another country's athlete to Olympic gold. That does not mean, however, that he doesn't sometimes imagine bringing his business back home. Maybe I'm building one in China. China. Later. <laughs> I don't <Yeah>. know. <laughs> you know, the system has been changing. Now the, um, the government is allowing uh, anybody to building up the, the schools, either for gymnastics or the fitness. Chiao can't hide a smile when talking about two young prospects training in his gym. Already U.S. champions, they should have very good potential, he says for the 2016 Olympics. Craig Morrow, CCTV, Des Moines, Iowa.
That's it for this edition of The Heat. We'd love to hear from you. So send us your questions, your comments, and topics that you'd like to see on our show to The Heat at cctv-america.com. Again, that's The Heat at cctv-america.com. And if you missed any of this week's show or to catch any of CCTV's programming online, log on to cctv-america.com. And remember, when the weekend rolls around again, don't forget to turn on The Heat. Until then, I'm Mike Walter in Washington, D.C. We'll see you next time.